So, all right, might as well start. Okay, so um, I just realized I'm a philologist. Let's <laughs> put that out there. <laughs> yeah, I just realized. Okay, so I'm going to pretend to be a reactionary today, and I'm going to be wrong instead of in the right, in the wrong, like a snake shedding its skin, or like dandruff from anxiety, while avoiding the eternal return of the same and the Hegelian synthesis. Being reactionary is going back and seeing the past as lived, lived experience, but definitely not in the Husserlian sense. It's experience I don't want to let go of or lose because that experience is irreducibly singular, going against the grain in Benjaminian terms and not homogeneous empty time. I'd like to continue and depart from the reflections I made in Taunting the Useful that can be found in Phonofictions and Other Felt Thoughts, that volume that catalyzed, <laughs> what's that? Classic text. Classic text. <laughs> A volume that catalyzed from Eldritch's work, um, Catalysis or Catalusis, I don't even know how to pronounce Catalysis or whatever. Uh, it's an interesting word in any case. Um, it comes from Catalane uh, to dissolve, which is related to the dissolution of governments from kata down or completely and lane to loosen. Only in, 19, in 1836 did it become a process of chemical change described as a change caused by an agent which itself remains unchanged. So catalyst, catalysis is a complete loosening down, a coming apart of government, and today a metaphor for chemical reaction. A reaction itself perhaps a metaphor for dissolution of government. Dissolution and reaction are two different aspects of catalysis, and they are not in any way an in an original relation, but rather refer to fault lines of history, fault lines of history of words, with the way signs change and reappear, reappear which merits its own archaeology. The work of boring, formless nonsense became wondrous gestural potential in my article, which was both a dissolution and a reaction. I'd like from here on to continue and depart, dissolve and react, to catalyze the idea of useless useful, as I developed there, but also to concentrate much more on what I had inadequately developed, that is to say that I had only in passing examined the work of Nathalie Le Duc, um, whose Chernotron 1400, a double-decker tandem that churns six tubs of bice cream was itself a catalyst for me to think about the useless in modal terms, in that I described it as the virtually useless as a, and as a process of taunting the useful. Etymological games like the one with catalysis are a waste of time. <laughs> they are useless. They are catalysts for thought, though, so they have a certain use. The Malamean turn on this catalysis, catabasis, a descending into the underworld of language like Orpheus to get the Eurydice notion who will dissolve into thin air. But this dissolution will nevertheless create an, alchem an alchemical reaction, a lieu, a place. The only thing that remains in this quasi-Hegelian, alchemical, catalytic, homeopathic movement. Uh, gender dynamics are involved, for sure. Uh, some Malami critics have shown uh, the text is the hymen and the poet's desire, his longing for the virgin space. But analyzed from a different perspective, um, it could also be seen as, as the dissolution of the subject, which became a form of depersonalization for the modernists, seen as a, dis a dissolution in technology. What is the dissolution of the subject in technology? The modernists were reacting to the useful, to art as serving some end, and in its stead created art for art's sake some pure aesthetic space removed from history and politics. Pure beauty 
devoid of any subjectivity. For Rimbaud, it was the other of the je est un autre. The pronoun I, not the subject, is another. This pure aestheticism in Nietzsche would be criticized by Benjamin in his book on the Trauerspiel precisely because it effaces history. So, um, let me skip that. So the eternal return of the same conceives of time as homogeneous and empty, whereas for Benjamin, going against the grain of history, history in tatters, violently pulled out of context, the archive can be a space of an encounter in the now time of a dialectic that evades temporal progression, creating a separate space. Contrary to the interpretation of this, the relationship between the past and the present, sorry, contrary to the common interpretation of this, the relationship is not some sort of simple reciprocation, but that of a suspension in movement. Going back, etymologically, would be this sort of movement in suspension. It's a serious work of archaeology, even though archaeology is in battle today, for it seems that we are more or less abandoning linguistics. While Derrida was alive, we did not permit ourselves to go to let go of the play of language. With his death, we could all either move on or do history, or go back to the things themselves. There is a part of OOO, speculative realism, new materialisms more generally, that has conflated the problem of language with correlationism and so on. I have, as a reactionary, this desire to trash Persian semiotics by favoring the Saussurian one, um, via Benveniste with his distinction between reception and understanding. But I'm probably wrong. Quite justifiably, language takes the same place that the visual does in, the West, in Western culture, at the expense of other elements in, in the felt and embodied or enacted. But the bioinformatic paradigm is re replacing archaeology and language at the site of problems now taken as a given, now that Derrida is dead, and despite the fact that Foucault is the most cited person in scholarship. We all use language, and we ignore it more and more as one particular language, English, is taking over the world, for now, anyway. At the expense of linguistic diversity, and there is so much more to be done with language precisely as we start to better grasp the felt, the embodied, which might help us to get beyond constructivism. And it is perhaps a question of styles and gestures that cannot be translated except through a new kind of approach that works with language to burst through the constructivist paradigm while simultaneously thinking the body and the experience of language. For the archive is language, and language is the archive. The felt cannot be transmitted, and what we have left is, what we're left with is a digging up of the past that brings us back by the necessity necessary contingency of archaeology. Archaeology tells us that philosophy is bound to language and thus bound to history. If we refuse this fact, then we are in a sense recuperating the transcendental and simply going back to a priori determinations. But anthropologically play, that defunct notion, is always there splitting and disrupting the diachronic ritual of the archive with synchronic gestures. There is, a, there is a connection between this process and the useless, insofar as neither play nor useless have an end. And I use that term in its double sense as finitude and telos, ending and purposiveness, something I'll need to explore later, especially in relation to what Benjamin means by end in messianic terms. This play without end, of course, could easily be interpreted as infinite regress, and that is the entire problem which is characterized as, a, as double, at once of a hypostatic emanation into existence, the fixed subject, and of the subject's infinite process of flight. Only when the subject is taken out of the equation as inappropriable and opening up to a new terrain can we think the status of the archive differently. And I'm referring to Gumbin's last uh, version, last uh, volume of Homo Sacker, The Use of Bodies. 
If the subject is seen as the expression of an energy and the subject is held as an autonomous force, then there is little hope. Rather, we would seek a liquidating of consciousness. I might skip this one. Uh, I tried to argue in Taunting the Useful that the useful useless is best articulated through the modalities, but that those modalities need to be challenged. I worked through different types of useless objects and how they might correspond to each of the four modalities, possible, impossible, necessary, contingent. I insisted that the contingent contains all the other ones and that the useful and the useless contain each other, not only logically but historically insofar as the discipline of philosophy had at its origin, its arche, Talmadzein, what Heidegger called Erstaunen, or wonder. Something Heidegger didn't explicitly interrogate was that this wonder depended on the useful, is defined against it. Heidegger set Erstaunen in opposition to Verwunderung, Bewunderung, Staunen, Bestaunen, which are like being stunned by at extraordinary things. Note that stunned is etymologically connected to staunen, as is the French étonné. Erstaunen is wonderment at ordinary, everyday things, which is what the philosopher ought to experience. Wonderment at basic things of the world. The non-philosopher, in the Greek sense, would not be interested in things for themselves, but only in the use that they may acquire from knowledge. This notion subtends the concept of so sophistry, for, for instance, a word I've always wondered at insofar in that it contains Sophia, wisdom, showing that the word contains its own destruction. The word also subtends the Western notion of knowledge as freedom, which for the Greeks was only possible through the use of a slave's body, as Agamben has shown in his use of bodies. The fine, I've already said that. Um, the modern university in the German sense of Bildung meant freedom to build one's own knowledge, whereas the contemporary university is increasingly oriented towards utility, studying for a job, research for the benefit of the economy or taxpayers. If the contemporary university has the notion of use at its core, it's because it has a relation of productivity which the Greeks didn't have, and the use of the body was a separate thing for the free person who relied on slaves. Today, that productivity in which we are all bound up has effaced this difference and, as I'm sure most of you understand, this plays out in the neoliberal and the biopolitical. In this, the animal status of the human expresses a will or a potential through work, something that, has, that was entirely foreign, though it's clear that Aristotle's earlier writing involved separating use from work, crisis from energeia. That we are all today involved in this sort of use of the body is not controversial, I think. But what is radical is the possibility of deactivating or decreating, impotential, impotentializing, defamiliarizing. Um, just to, 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 uh, that Agamemnon has developed in the last few decades, and that she develops from a cluster of ideas related to Nancy and Blanchot's inoperativity, uh, where, uh, which were in turn working through Bataille and Heidegger, um, especially Heidegger's notion that the artwork was an unworking of its own articulations and thereby an opening up of itself beyond the object towards its own history and intelligibility. This decreation is a development in Agamben's own idiosyncratic way of Deleuze's notion of the virtual. Yet that this is not without problems. If Deleuze's philosophy is problematic in that it ignores history in the same way I believe Nietzsche does, Agamben on his side has failed to find a way forward beyond a sort of radical passivity that many find problematic, including Negri. Yet I think we've been a little too simplistic with uh, Gambin, it's clear that he's not saying, as Le Capre claims, um, that things don't take place. It sounds like a very simple re reduction, um, that one can't communicate things. The inappropriable means that it cannot become yours. I don't think I'll solve this today. <laughs> so I'm just going to switch to I'm going to switch to Nathalie Le Duc's. I'm, I'm trying to dissolve it. Okay to catalyze it. Um, 
so anyway, um, I think if we look at Nathalie Leduc's uh, work, and we can find a sort of hybrid monster of virtuals that can help us uh, reconfigure desubjectification or desubjectivization and community. Uh, she's inspired by many things, but most importantly by the pataphysicians. Uh, also in part by Rube Goldberg, I don't know if you know that guru Goldberg. Uh, anyway, the, the, it's the, but also by the, Les Shadok, is the 70s uh, animated uh, a cartoon. Um, and their motto was, Pourquoi faire simple quand on peut faire compliqué? Why make something simple when you can make it complicated? And she's always using uh, Tron at the end of all of her work. Um, in order to highlight this idea of what she calls innovation desuet, um, uh, outmoded innovations, um, quelque chose de nouveau qui est déjà dépassé, something new that's already passé. Um, so she has the Chernatron 1400, the Tunatron 2000.03, the Photophonotron Tron 3000, the Portraitron, Portraitron. 2300, the multi cyclotron, mm -hmm. the then we diatron, <laughs> which is really cool because it's, it's a huge bubble and you have to pedal a bike that has a fan uh, because there's people in there. If you stop pedaling it, they'll die. <laughs> um, so, this is the, the photophonotron, and uh, there she is with her lab coat. Um, I was going to show some videos of the making of, yeah, I, I guess I can while I talk. Uh, that's the por Portraitron. Um, it's a performance in which Nathalie writes the portrait of someone pedaling with a modified electric typewriter whose electricity has been cut and therefore depends on the pedaler's energy. <laughs> Nathalie says that by complicating the process, by going from electricity to the mechanical, a sort of devolution of um, and also, she needs a mirror in order to be able to see uh, the, 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 the pedal. Um, so she, she, she implicates the, the spectator in the process, too, which increases the potential for error. If the cyclist pedals too quickly, this creates holes in the paper. If they go too slow, the machine stops. Um, <coughs> and so uh, I'll just, maybe I'll, there's another image. <laughs> And that's the kind of final result you'd have. So it's a typewriter. This is her multi Um You can see the, the pataphysical in there. <laughs> I'll skip it. I probably don't have time. If you want to see it later, I'm happy to show it to you. Uh, and this is what she has to say. Um, oops, <coughs> lost my page. Okay, so she, um, when she thinks about uh, experience, so the concept of experience, uh, she sees that in English the French word expérience has two different words. Normally it's the opposite. There's two French words for one English word. In this, this case, there's two English words for one French word. Experience as in personal experience and experiment. Uh, so both those are expérience. Uh, but there's also experimentation, she says. Although the experience of something, in, uh, although to the experience, to experience something in French, you can experimenter quelque chose. Uh, so that, that sense comes back to one. Um, and I wonder what this has to do with use insofar as use of something creates an, an odd subject relation that is actually historically determined. For the Greeks, crisis or use was connected to the genitive and the dative rather than to the accusative as it is for us moderns, which means that they went through things in the world as determined by those things rather than a subject using them. Uh, so it seems that the way an artist uses things can describe a different way of thinking our relation to objects in a post-subjective way. This is also connected to the way we think of knowledge since the dawn of modernity, uh, knowledge has been the accumulation, uh, a sense of accumulation um, whereas for the ancients, you died with your knowledge because it was experience. Um, uh, 
your knowledge died with you. I'll skip a bit. I was going to talk about Benjamin. Anyway, here's the quote. I think that in art, there's a lot of experimentation, a sort of pseudo experiment of, of pseudoscience. The scientist is interested in repeated experiment, which leads to the same result from which laws can be created, which predict in some way situations or experience. In art, experimentation permits the creation of new forms of art, of new situations which are, on the contrary, unique. In this uniqueness, evidence is success uh, in art. I don't know why there's a question mark there. <laughs> I typed it quickly last night. And which would offer the public a certain experience. In my projects, there is often this reference to the experimental, the use of a lab coat, and the archetype of the amateur inventor. For the portrait tron, for instance, I use helmets which, which resemble the one in Back to the Future. But this experimentation is more playful and parodic. Always, however, with these experimentations, there is a desire to create objects or situations as solutions to real or imaginary problems, which is taken from one of the definitions of pataphysics, which might be considered as tending towards the useless. <clears throat> I, I myself tried. If you want to look at this, I tried to do, I tried to play around with useless etymological games. Um, so I'm going to try and develop a kind of pataphysics of etymology. Uh, so why? So the pour complication. Uh, so in the for the sake of or in, in order to to make something more complicated than it needs to be, uh, which is actually my paper in some ways. So then <laughs> what I did was I broke it down into Latin, and then I translated the Latin into Greek. And I came up with pro polu poesis, p, 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 p. <laughs> um, So I'm trying to do these games with etymology. Um, you know, anyway, I think I'll skip that. Just run out of time anyways. OK, that's good. Um, <laughs> limits are good. So I like this quote. So the articulation of the modalities of non-knowledge. Um, where can we go with that? Um, there's this quote from Agamben. How much time do I have? Um, you're over time. OK. You can <laughs> take, take, take another two minutes if you want. OK, so yeah. I'll skip the quote. Um, I might as well just stop. <laughs> <laughs>